make you to go, this is okay, this is works for me now? Look, I think I have sport to thank for that because mm. I had to get out there in shorts and run and, and get back into daily life. But it was quite strange. It was, I think going back to school, school was probably one of the hardest things for kids to go through. And I think that was the hard part was going to school with my leg out when I used to have two legs and people staring at me and yeah. some of them not knowing how to take me. But like I said, I had a boyfriend and we'd go to the beach and I'd hop around the beach and go on crutches. I didn't care about that. And I didn't yeah. care about being in that environment. But being at school, for some reason, I just wanted to be like normal, I suppose. Of course. Uh, so I didn't get involved in school sports and, and didn't think I could for some reason. And mm. now I know that that was silly, but it was how I was. Because sport was a huge part pre when you had your old leg. Yeah. And then when you learnt to dance and walk on your new leg, you wanted to start to run. Mm -hmm. So did you go, I'm just going to do this? And you set some pretty high goals for yourself. Uh, yeah, I guess when I decided to learn how to run, it wasn't really about competing for Australia or being the best. I just wanted to learn how to run again. And, and Dad and I went out the front of my house, actually, and, and drew 10 metres up to 100 metres. Um, and, and we both taught, he taught me and my physio taught me how to run on, on my walking leg. And it was quite hard and there was many fights and falls. But eventually when I found out about the Paralympics, that's when I saw these amazing elite athletes with disabilities competing all over the world and I thought that's what I want to do. You know, I don't know whether I would have gone anywhere with netball or whatever, but yeah. I had this opportunity now that I could start training and, and being this, this elite athlete and, and doing that and that's when I wanted to do it. And I got a coach and I started training and I set myself a goal to go to London, which was last year. But yeah. when I started running and my, I looked at the times on the computer and my 100 metres and realised that I could probably I'm go pretty to good at this. <laughs> yeah, you know, and doors started opening, and uh, I had my I heart set on Beijing, and I qualified. So I was very lucky, and I scraped in, and I met who, one of my best friends now, and we, you know, started at the same time, and we're we're roommates now at um, camps and and training camps, and we've spent the whole journey together, and yeah, so I'm glad right. that I made that Beijing qualify because it set me up for the future. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Which is how, so when did you start training and when did you qualify for Beijing? Uh, so I think I started training at about, oh, it would have been start of 2007, end of 2006. And I qualified for Beijing at the start of 2008. So it's it was incredible. very quickly, yeah, it was, it was pretty unexpected. And I did just, like I said, scrape in the start of 2008. But yeah. Uh, you know, I went along and I competed with the Australian team and came last <laughs> in my race. You're still there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ran a little bit slower than I'd, I'd hoped, but to run in front of 70,000 people as opposed to 30 people at your local track. In what front does of that feel? I can't even imagine what that would feel oh, like. I'm, I get so nervous at the smallest things and stand out there with all these girls that had been training for years and I looked like a little weed compared to them. I just looked up, you could not see your family anywhere. Yeah. I was so overwhelmed and so nervous and so scared and, you know, thinking about things you shouldn't, am I going to fall over, I'm going to stuff up, but it was, it was amazing and once you get, get it done once, you want to do it again. You want to yeah. Do it again. Yeah. So you, do, you didn't race that in your walking leg though, because you've got two, don't yeah. you? So yeah. we're competing. A competing running leg and a walking leg. So you can't, you can't really walk in a running leg, it's not comfortable and you can't really run in a walking leg. So but you learnt to run in a walking leg. I did, my old leg was... Um, like I, I like to say a piece of crap <laughs> yeah right and it was a bit of a door hinge so you could sort of control it a little bit better and it was hard to run on it was very slow I think I ran 25 seconds for 100 that's pretty but... good I couldn't do that <laughs> <laughs> oh I hope I'm a lot faster than that now but uh, this leg's actually computerized the one I've got on now so it's set up just for walking and everyday life so you can't run on it but where my running leg's actually less technical and it's sort of you want to control it rather than it control you. Right. Yeah. And so you have to charge your walking leg, don't I do, you? I do. I do have to charge it, which I still Do you pop it to. next to your iPhone? Do you charge do. your iPhone and your leg at the same time? I do. And it's really funny because it lasts five days and I still manage to somehow run out do of battery. You. So <laughs> what happens if you run out of battery? The knee doesn't bend and it stiffs, uh, goes stiff. And will you still walk or use it? Or? Yeah, I'll walk, but uh, it's happened many times at the shopping centre and people don't want to walk next to me because I have to swing it all the way around. <laughs> And I'm, I'm people just like, oh my god, actually, it's really funny because it was, I was at the opening ceremony in London and I must have forgotten for the last five days to charge it and I ran out of battery and I was standing, you know, listening to the music and all of a sudden I hear the beeping and someone had to oh push no. me in a wheelchair back because oh it was no. like five kilometres back to the village. Uh, it was quite funny, but I learnt my lesson there and I've been really good since. Are they really expensive, your legs? They are. The, the leg that I'm wearing at the moment is actually $100,000. Wow. Yeah. So do you, ha do you do fundraisers? Like, how do you raise that kind of money? 
I'm very lucky that I got sponsored from Autobock, which is a, a German-based company who, who make majority of parts all over the world. So I have a great prosthetist, um, David Howes, in Sydney, who actually right. puts all my legs together, and he's been there from the get-go to me. But I was lucky that Autobock, you know, sent over the parts for me to actually to wear, wow. um, which is awesome. But my dad and I actually took out a loan of $60,000 after about three years of walking on that crap leg and mm. realising that, you know, in, in five years' time, my hip's going to be out and I'm not going to be able to achieve and do lots of things like I wanted to do. And it's, it's unfair because, you know, TAC, work cover, mm. lots of insurance places, you know, help out people if they lose their legs those ways, those, that way or arms. But for me, it's, it's not, the money's not it there. It doesn't, it's the not covered. No, it's not. You, you do get a certain amount of money, but to put in perspective, you know, you, you need more than $1,000. You know, that's not, not no, going to cover anything. And no. I don't need, I'm not saying I need a $100,000 leg every five years, but it'd be good to have something to help me do everyday life. So how do you, how do you change that? Do I, I don't, you know, the NDIS is, is coming into effect, but at the moment I haven't seen any changes for me through that. Yeah, right. But they are trying to make it better and, and hopefully in the future it'll be, you know, legs will be available to everybody and you should be able to get what you want to make your life as, you know, what it would God, have been before. yeah. And because same with your sport, you yep. um, do uh, triple jump. Uh, long long jump, jump, sorry. Yeah. Long <laughs> jump. Know, that's fine. Long jump and 100. And, yeah. and sprinting. But with most sports, unless it's AFL or, you know, you are a Michael Klim or something, yeah. there's no money in it. Uh, so yeah. how do you, do you do big fundraisers to get, to get, to, like with all Olympians? Yeah. How do you raise your money to do your sport and to live? Yeah, I mean, I work. I did work leading up to London, but also the Paralympic Committee, you know, do a great job of fundraising to get us there so that we don't have to pay to, to, to get to the Paralympics. Right, okay. They do their own fundraising themselves and they're always, you know, ha needing help with that as well because there's a big team to send over. And they're amazing and they have amazing sponsors. Uh, but for ourselves, it's hard to, you know, train every day and do those physio appointments and pay for everything that comes with sport. And I'm lucky that I was with the Victorian Institute of Sport and had that scholarship. Right for all the doctor and the physios. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, Athletics Australia and, and, and sport bodies now are actually becoming a lot better with, you know, meeting that level of funding for able bods and disabled athletes. Yeah, and right. It's, it's worked on a ranking and it's worked on, on where you are in the world and how well you go at certain events. And so if you do well at a certain event and you're ranked in the top three, there's a certain amount of funding now for you. Right, okay. It's not enough to completely live off. No. But it's getting better and it, it's going to get better and better. So it's really good.